All right, so we're going to continue in chapter seven tonight. It's called the straight testimony and the ceiling. Mm -hmm. The straight testimony and the ceiling. It was good, good, good last week. And I promise you, it will not disappoint tonight. Let me just pray one more time. Lord, thank you for uh, this moment where uh, we focus our prayers by digging into the word, becoming good Bereans, and then trying to understand each other and hashing some things out. Because just like a good communion service, your children always want to be on one accord. And we cannot do it without your spirit and your guidance and your wisdom. We thank you for all of that in Jesus name, amen, amen. All right, so here we are. What are we gonna find out tonight? We, we talked about the straight testimony last week, just an introduction to it. And now we're gonna go further. We're in Revelation chapter seven, specifically two and three. And here it is. And I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying, hurt not, you see that? Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees. Okay, uh, let's move this, I can't move it out of the way, it's in the way. All right, there we go. Uh, uh, nor the trees till we have sealed uh, the servants of our God in their foreheads. Tonight's topic is the seal of God. Tonight's topic is the seal of God. Looking for someone to help me read tonight as we get started on page six. Page 76, paragraph one, we're talking about the ceiling. Anybody want to read tonight? Nobody? Well, I'll read it. <laughs> Nobody wants to read. I'll, I'll read to you, Pastor. Oh, oh, Elder Stone, praise the Lord. You haven't read for me in a minute. You owe me. Come on, <laughs> Elder Stone. <laughs> the ceiling. The seventh chapter of Revelation begins by portraying angelic forces at work in the last days. They are about ready to unleash Satan so he can make his final attack against our planet. But God has stationed powerful angels on the four corners of the earth, Revelation 7-1, to hold the devastation at bay. Then God sends another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, verse two. That angel instructs the other to hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads, verse three. Here we have the seal of the living God. The result of understanding and experiencing this proper balance between the law and the gospel. It affects both the inner and outer person. The seal calls special attention to the great doctrines of justification by faith and the seventh day Sabbath. Stan. Right, all right, all right. So just a question. Before we get started, let me see. I hear some background interference from someone. I'd like somebody riding a motorcycle. Let me figure out who that is. I don't know where that's coming from. Oh, it's not me. No, it's not me. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to figure it out as we go. Question. What is the seal of God. Anybody want to take a stab at it? What's the seal of God? Uh, Pastor? Yes? It, the seal of God is the settling in to the truth. The seven-day Sabbath, which is 
um, mm -hmm. part of his seal based on the fourth commandment because it identifies who he is, his territory, his authority. But it also is the inner person. It has to be not just the outward show, but the inner man, the, the character has to be changed to be exactly like Christ. Man, well, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. I, I think you covered just about all the bases. Anybody have anything to add to that? Okay, so it looked like somebody dropped there. Okay, well, let's, uh, let me ask another question because she did pretty good. Um, when do saints receive God's seal? I'm quiet tonight. It make me think I'm teaching the right lesson tonight. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go on, and I'll let the lesson tell you. All right, Elder Stone, let's keep going. Uh, page 76, paragraph 4. Adventists have often limited their understanding of the seal of God as being the Sabbath, but the Sabbath seal not only represents the law portion of the message that we are to give to the world, the seal of God also involves the message being justified or the message of being justified by his grace through faith. We receive this seal at conversion. Wow, does that surprise you? Did you hear that surprise in my voice? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's why yeah. we're on here. We're gonna get it together. We're gonna get our lives together. <laughs> that's that's the, the, the early rain experience. Mm -hmm. We receive the early rain, but um, that's for your first growth. But this, the seal that they were talking about in Revelation, that's that final sealing before mm -hmm. the harvest. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's the latter rain mm -hmm. um, of, of pouring out that Holy Spirit. So if we receive this seal, Okay, okay, yeah. At conversion, that's that early rain, but to actually bring forth uh, a harvest, to, to bring forth fruits, as, as John. Well, you're Baptist. mixing two things together, Elder. Okay. Um, the rain is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, right? Okay. And the Holy Spirit starts the church, empowers the church, and keeps the church. There are two groups of people in Revelation 14. Uh, there are the people giving the loud cry because they are converted, because they have settled in into the truth. Mm -hmm. And then there's another group of people receiving the loud cry and coming out of Babylon and the sealing is taking place. So, um, we, we, we have tended to just focus on the latter, the second group. But somebody mentioned it the other night in our other study about the, the parable of the virgins, five foolish, five wise. It, if, you, if you take away, strip away all the imagery of it, the lesson there is there's a group of people who's supposed to be ready when all this stuff starts going down. So there's the people who are ready and they are getting others ready. And all of that's done through the power of the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't negate the fact that there's a group ready. And that group is called the remnant, right? And that remnant adds to their number. As a matter of fact, Revelation 14 seems to kind of indicate that most of God's people are not in the fold when this loud cry is given out, but they respond to it and come out from all kinds of churches and non-church, whatever. Uh, so, but we're gonna talk about this tonight. It's gonna get gooder, gooder, gooder. And, uh, and we're, gonna, we're gonna fix this thing up to where we have the right perspective on it. Uh, Sister Audrey, you wanted to add something. Yes, wouldn't you say the ceiling is a process continuously because those who 
go to sleep in the Lord, they are, are they are sealed at, at their at their demise, at their death. Would you That's a great point. That? And we we're gonna we're gonna walk right into that, Audrey, because that is exactly how we know we're on track by knowing that see when we the way we know that sealing begins at conversion is because mm -hmm. most of the saints won't be here. Uh, during the time of trouble, they would have already be in their graves, right? Most of the saints throughout history, if they're already in their graves, then how can they be sealed if they weren't sealed already? All right, but uh, we're going to go further because it, I think we're going to have a good time tonight. All right, I like the way you read that, Elder Stone. You probably read it the way most people were thinking it. <laughs> so let's go on to, to the next part. It is an experience we continue to grow into until the promised day of our redemption at Christ's coming. We see this in what Paul wrote to the Ephesians concerning the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing an understanding of Christ's forgiveness to them. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven you. Ephesians 4, 30 through 32. You see it there, Elder Stone, other than my tender-heated comment. It's supposed to be tender-hearted. You read it right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but do you see it in that verse, Elder Stone? Yes. Whereby yes. ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Yes, and Paul and everybody else is, is, is imploring, please don't grieve the Holy Spirit. There's something he's doing in your life that is as, as important as life and death. It is, you know, life and death depends upon this process. So do not grieve the Holy Spirit, right? So whether we die before the time of trouble or whether we are alive during the time of trouble, the sealing is taking place in each and every one of us. All right? Okay. All right, let's continue. Simply put, it works like this. The gospel of redemption through Christ's grace sets a seal upon us as it frees us from the guilt of our sinfulness. Wow. Before our conversion, we view the law as our enemy because it condemned us. But being released from the guilt and condemnation of the law through grace, we come to view the law as a benefactor. Ooh. We're not supposed to talk yet, but I got it. I can't just pass this up. Y'all mind if I throw in an extra conversation? Come this on with it. This is so good. As you know, Genesis and Revelation are bookends, right? And everything in between is to get us from that day when Adam and Eve hid from God. They were given a law. All of it was summed up in one command, right? You can have anything you want but this tree over here don't touch it that was the law and then they did it anyway and God came looking for them and when God came looking for them their perception of God had changed and they didn't see God the way they saw him before and they didn't look the same to God he says where are you he knows where they are physically, but spiritually, mentally, emotionally, something in the connection was lost. And they should have been consumed at that moment. The law that God gave required their death. And yet, they experience grace all in that one episode. Yeah. They received the law, and it was clear. They broke the law, and then they were consumed by the guilt of their sinfulness. And while they were yet in sin, Jesus came looking for them, 
gave them grace on a promise of the cross later on down the road. And the gospel is all there in Genesis. It's all there in that episode of Adam and Eve disobeying God, but experiencing grace. The entire gospel is there. And why am I emphasizing this? Because again and again, I see people teaching and preaching to disregard the Old Testament. It happened again yesterday. And I couldn't believe the crowd of people who were saying amen. You know, he said, let's navigate through the Bible. You know, there, there's a, uh, uh, when you're navigating a ship, there's a certain amount of degrees you can't go because of the wind. You just can't go that way. And the Bible is just like that. The law is that wind that we can't fight through. So we only need to focus on what Paul said. We only need to focus on the four gospels and we need to disregard the Old Testament because the gospel isn't in the Old Testament. And everybody said, amen. Wow. It just happens again and again and again. And brothers and sisters, so many people are in danger of being lost through church. And the worst part about it is people are taking away their choices. They, they're not being shown the love of Christ from Genesis to Revelation. It's a hateful God in the Old Testament and a wonderful God in the New Testament. And so what happens is without the law, we continue in sin believing that we're saved. This is what God is trying to avoid. This is what God is trying to clean up uh, in these lessons that we're learning. Because we are actors if we don't reconcile. You gotta mute yourself if you just came in. Thank you. Uh, we're it, it, without confronting the law and trying to skip around it and run to grace. We are acting because we haven't dealt with our guilt and our shame. And nobody can be connected to God without dealing with their guilt and shame. That's why people don't like to pray. And so this is so important. I, I know I was going to let y'all come in. I didn't get a whole conversation. But look at what it says. It says, before our conversion, we viewed the law as our enemy because it condemned us. And if you listen closely to how people respond, even in our church, how they respond to the law, they respond to it as if it's attacking them. You know, why are you telling me what I can't do? Why are you trying to tell me how I should do things? As if God is our enemy because you can't separate God from the law. So we gotta get back into a healthy relationship with God because many of us are like Adam and Eve, we're hiding, we're covering up, hiding. When God says, there's no need for that. Come on out and let me be your father because I know exactly what you need and how to give it to you, but I can't if you're hiding. In fact, how in the world can you taste grace without understanding the law? But anyway, let's move on, uh, Elder Stone. I hadn't talked up the time. Go ahead, Elder. Amen. <laughs> um, paragraph five. We now recognize that it teaches us how to live a life of peace and love. As did David, we can now proclaim Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119, 97. Even when we fall short of obeying that law, we do not turn bitter toward its demands. Hmm. Mm. Okay, I'm passed up the temptation. Go ahead, Elder. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Though we have failed to meet its stipulations, we know it does not condemn us. In light of Christ's covering grace, through years of experiencing this relationship between the law and grace, our love and appreciation for both deepens. Mm. The final result is that we arrive in a place in our Christian walk 
where we depend entirely on justification by grace for our spiritual standing with God, apart from our efforts to obey his law. Mm. Amen. Amen. Ooh, this brother is preaching. Amen. Mm. Yet we also develop such reverence for his will as expressed through the law that we would rather die than knowingly violate one of its precepts. Mm. All right. This is what we, for those who can't see on the phone, I have what we see in Revelation seminars. God's seal contains his name, the Lord your God, his title, the creator, his territory, heaven and earth. That's all found in the fourth commandment. And we are taught it in such a way where it leaves us believing that, wow, if I reverence God's Sabbath, I'm safe. And that is true to a certain extent, but it is a testing truth, just as a tithe is a test. God doesn't need or want our money, but it is a test of who is God in our life. So is the Sabbath. It is a testing truth that separates the creator from false gods, right? And it, it, it reminds us that he is our creator. And also it keeps us in a position of being dependent upon his grace and his mercy toward us, his guidance, his protection, all of those things that we know. It's more than just keeping the seventh day. It is reverencing the God of the seventh day. And when we see it properly, everything else begins to fall into place. That's why we got to get in this healthy relationship with the law and grace. We have to learn how to balance the two and see the benefits of both and how they work together to get us to become what God created us to be. If you're too heavy on one or the other, then you're outside of the will of God. If you, if you only focus on grace, you're going to abuse it. If you only focus on the law, you're going to abuse that against others. Either way, the dependence upon God leading us day by day, moment by moment, is gone when we take one or the other away. Any thoughts on that? All right. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Yes. For me, looking at how the uh, people, the Israelites of old, mm -hmm. especially the Pharisees, kept the law to the nth degree, mm -hmm. very meticulously, knowing the word of God verbatim. It, it, it makes me realize that, that is no, there's no salvation in that. Mm -hmm. The salvation is by grace. And because God has given me the grace, now that's when the law comes into play. He gives me the power to walk in his law correctly because just like the Israelites of old, their interpretation was off. And so is ours. We all process this gospel message through the sieve of our own culture, our, our experiences, our gender, everything that's happened to us in the past or what we've heard or seen or felt, we, we process the gospel through that. But that does not mean that we have a correct understanding that's why even christ's disciples who walked with him lived with him ate with him everything for years were still so uh uninformed they were oblivious to his true meaning of the kingdom of god until after his resurrection and he he had to teach them all over 
um, what he really came to do to establish the, the spiritual kingdom, not an earthly kingdom. All right, somebody getting a call from the matrix. You gotta, gotta mute yourself out if you're not talking there. Oh, thank you, Elder. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, anybody else? Hi, <clears throat> this is Sister Whitlock. I yeah. was thinking about how the rich young ruler and Nicodemus came to Christ. And both of them said how meticulously they had kept the law. And Christ did not disagree with them. But he said, but you must be born again. And this is what you get when you keep in step, walk with Christ. By beholding, we become changed. We not only need to keep the law, we need to get to know the maker of the law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, right. Go ahead. Elma Hood, um, one of the things that, that we need to remember is God is a God of balance. Mm -hmm. And because he's a God of balance, you can't have grace unless you did something wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't, um, if, I, if I sin and I don't get punished like I should, that's grace. But mm -hmm. I can only get that if I've done something. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the thing people forget. So they feel, okay, let's throw out the Old Testament. But you can't have the Old Testament without the New Testament because the Old Testament gives you all the information about the New Testament. Right. And Jesus kept uh, quoting it, and Paul quotes it, and uh, some of the other prophets quote over and over over again, which tells us that we have to have both. It has to be a balance. Amen. Amen. People are driving off here. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any, anyone else? All right. If not, we're going to move on. Okay. All right. Let's go on. We won't be too much longer. Okay. Uh, Elder uh, Stone? Yes. Uh, this is page 77, paragraph two. This is the sealing process. Although we receive the seal at conversion, its imprint deepens in our lives as we grow in grace. Through grace, we can become so totally committed to God that nothing can ever sever that relationship. It is what Ellen White was talking about when in reference to the sealing, she wrote that the sealing is, quote, a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Ellen White Commons, Volume 4, page 1161. Yes, you mentioned this earlier. All mm -hmm. right. So well, here we go. When God's people become thus settled, the final shaking will begin. Wow. Wow. See, this statement is grace. God yes. is doing everything he can to get his people settled into the faith. And then he allows those four, four winds to be released. Elder Hood, go ahead. Yes, and then thinking of uh, what was just read, um, the paragraph before, I'll go back for it. This, this is how we overcome. This is how we perfect our faith, how we grow, because grace is not just a matter of, okay, I did something wrong and I'm still here, you know, because the wages of sin is death. Grace help is what God gives to help me to overcome so that I am sealed. So mm -hmm. when I'm able to, uh, so I'm grace empowers me to mm -hmm. overcome sin. Mm -hmm. And so the more uh, I overcome as the, that, that part, um, uh, this part, although, uh, although we receive uh, the seal at conversion, it imprints deepens in our lives as we grow in grace. And so the more we're empowered to overcome, the stronger we become in our, in our commitment and walk 
with Christ. And so, you know, I can see how it ties into the next little pair uh, sentence that was read in reference to um, when God's people, when we get to that point, then the shaking will begin because we have, uh, we're settled in our faith. And so now God, we, we, we can withstand the test of time that's to come upon, of course, you know, when things begin to really happen in, in, in the church and with God's people. So, yeah, that's what I think about when I think of, of grace, growing in grace is, is, is God empowering uh, me by the, you know, to overcome, mm-hmm. um, to overcome sin in my life. Amen. Well, you know, we should look at the wheat and the tear like we look at Cain and Abel. Both have the same opportunity. But the deciding factor really comes down because they both worked hard, Cain and Abel. But the deciding factor came down to how they viewed God. How how do we look at God? How do we see him? Through his law. Right? So Cain looked at, he did his work, but he did it with resentment. Well, how can you say that? Because what was his problem? His problem was he was obsessed with what he thought he deserved. Ah, he didn't really embrace grace, you see? Because you can't embrace grace and keep talking about what you deserve, right? And so he, he reluctantly obeyed. You know, why, would, why else would God ask him why his countenance had fallen? And some of us need to ask ourselves this very question tonight. If we are constantly upset with what God requires from us, then maybe we are like Cain in that way. We are reluctantly obeying. Well, haven't I done enough? Some of us, our spouses have said that to us. Haven't you given enough to that church? Don't you spend enough time at that? You know, and, and, and you look at your spouse as a loving person, but when it comes to God, sometimes it can be a divider, can it? Right? And I'm not saying you have a bad spouse. I'm just saying that to, for this illustration purpose, we can see the difference in our reverence for God. You know, somebody walks by and say, you always reading. Man, you hadn't read enough? And they're not really talking to you. I need you to understand that. There's no reason for you to be mad with another church member another day. Because a lot of times what they're spewing out of their mouth isn't toward you. It's really toward God. Same thing when, when we have to understand. You know, who told you you had to understand everything? <laughs> I mean, if we had the capacity to do that, then we'd be equal with God. And who wants to, I mean, who has the nerve to believe that? But yet we have that issue, don't we? Some people will not move, will not cooperate, will not obey until it makes sense to them. Mercy. So but there's no reason to be offended Because the bottom line is, though they're looking at you, though they're speaking to you, like Cain slew Abel, they're not really upset with you. The issue is they have not settled into the faith. They still are saying, still looking at it like they're losing by serving God. I'm missing something. Somebody's taking something from me. If I didn't have to do this for God, I could be over here doing this. Those are the markers of people who have not settled into the faith. All right, we're gonna finish this, I promise you. Elder, you still up for it? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Page 77, paragraph three. Historically, Adventists have believed and taught that the last great test of our faith will be over the Sabbath issue. I totally agree. However, the issue is much deeper than which day we observe as Sabbath. The Sabbath is only like a buoy on a lake. Boats avoid the visible buoy 
because it alerts them to the fact that something bigger and more serious lurks beneath the water surface. Okay, Elder Stone, what do you think about that example? I think it's a very accurate picture because um, even with Adventists, younger, younger Adventists, uh, we had this conversation uh, recently about the day, you know, and then they wanted to share with me some, some truth that the Gr Gregorian calendar really isn't the correct calendar. The Jewish <laughs> calendar is different. And so the day that we call Sabbath isn't really even, I said, you know what, on <laughs> this round sphere of earth in this United States, going from one coast to the other one, you lose hours, you gain hours, the times shift according to as we know it. I said, so God, being the God that he is, he knows if in your heart you are keeping Sabbath as worship to him to the best of your knowledge. That's all we can do to the best of our knowledge. And, and God, being God, he knows if you're actually trying to worship him or trying to be uh, like, like Saul was, you know, I, I got to get all the knowledge. I got to get all the information. I got to know everything before I can really, really make a move. Mm -hmm. God knows. And so the Sabbath is just the tip of the iceberg. It's the outward display of something really going on deeper in your heart. Yeah, it's a soft spot. It's a testing truth. You know, because people can hide in other things that are quite, uh, they have immediate physical benefit. For instance, thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal. I can see what I get out of keeping that law. And others keeping that law keeps me safe. Uh, but commandments such as the Sabbath, they touch that soft spot because it really, the only real reason to keep it is your reverence for God. Because you don't lose, I mean, from a, from a, uh, a non-believer point of view, you don't lose anything financially or physically by not doing it uh, from the worldly point of view. Uh, so what, what use is this, this commandment at all? You know, why don't I just make any time I want the Sabbath? And when you start going down that road, you're telling on yourself because it's, you're exposing how much reverence you actually have for God. And, uh, and then that's a straw man argument anyway. To start talking about the clock and the calendar, that's not the issue. The issue is, are, do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul? That is the issue. And if you do, you wouldn't even wanna take the chance of disappointing him. All right, Elder Hood, you want to say something? No, that's it. All right. I just wanted to add one little thing too, sure. with this uh, this COVID and the series of churches that have not had their do doors open. It has been a, a test individually, personally, mm -hmm. when the sun goes down on Friday. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to get up and get dressed and, and go out to service on Sabbath. So now what are you going to do? Mm. Are you going to still be watching your little show? Mm. Oh, it's just 15 minutes into the Sabbath. I, I, I'll be able to watch that. I'll be mm. able to do this or, you know. So it's a very personal, mm -hmm. very personal, private, one-on-one -on -one between you and God. And he brings conviction, you know, okay, is, is that how you're going to do me? <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, please forgive me. You know, help me do better. Yeah, you're describing the purpose of the law. I just, uh, it cannot save us, but it makes us keenly aware of where we are. It shows us how much we need God and depend on God to get us through. Sister Whitlock, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say, it's, the Bible says it's God that gives us the power <clears throat> to mm -hmm. get wealth, okay? 
the rich young ruler was wealthy. God had made him wealthy. But mm -hmm. when he asked him to sell what he had and give to the poor, you could see really where his love was. He really worshiped the money more than anything. You know, mm -hmm. he couldn't part with it. And there's nothing that could come between you and God. So it isn't just the letter of the law. Mm -hmm. It's the spirit of the law. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Perfect. It's a testing truth. It, 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 it causes us to reveal our hearts. All right, Elder. So let me look at the time. Oh, yeah. We got to get on to the finish line. Go okay. ahead. Uh, page 77, paragraph three. Likewise, the controversy over God's law, the Sabbath Sunday issue, only alerts us to the fact of a deeper conflict about how he saves the human race. All right, here it is. This is our last conversation for tonight and then we're gonna continue uh, this conversation on next week. I hope that this, these, uh, this book has been eye-opening for you, especially if you're an Adventist, uh, because when we exchange information with one another, a lot of times some context and some details are lost by listening to other people. You really got to, to get in there and dig for yourself, All right? So, um, uh, so here, here we are. Oh, Elderhood, go ahead. So uh, briefly in reference to what everyone has said, and uh, I agree with the, um, what was said. And, you know, I think about the Sabbath in reference to how, you know, uh, for me, it was a matter of whether I'm going at one time in my life, it was a matter of whether, you know, I'm going to be able to provide or not provide because, you know, the job says you have to work. And so, you know, to stand and say, I'm going to honor God means that I lose my livelihood. And so I think about it from the perspective of if, 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 if I have trouble now standing on on what I know is truth, it'll be harder, that much harder when it comes to something much greater that I have to be willing to sacrifice or give up for the sake of or stand on for the sake of being obedient to God. And I was reading about Sarah um, and um, uh, Abraham and Sarah and had he obeyed God um, uh, in the beginning, it would have been easier to obey him and other things because it, it, the faith is in the word of God. And so when we believe God and take him at his word, that's what we stand on, you know, and the expectation. And so if God tells us to do something, then we have to trust that he's going to keep us because we're being obedient to God. And so I thought about that in that when he made the promise and said, look, your, your descendants will, will be as the stars. And when he listened to his wife instead of God, now when it was time to, to trust him uh, uh, in reference to what his word had said, uh, Sister White says it was more difficult. The test became greater had he not trusted God uh, in the beginning. So I thought about that in reference to me and trusting God along my journey of what he says I should and shouldn't do according to his word. So the more that I exercise my faith because his grace is, is what empowering us according to the lesson tonight to be, to be able to do whatever it is that he's asking us to do so that when the shaking comes, we're like that tree planted. And so we will be firmly planted and won't be, you know, can't be shaken out ourselves as a result of what's to come. So I just thought about that in reference to the Sabbath issue, that the more we um, trust him in the things that we know, the easier it is for us to stand. But when we're compromising a little here and a little there, as uh, Elder Stone said, you know, during the pandemic, what has my life been like? when it comes to my Sabbath experience. And so, you know, what could have been simple becomes even that much harder 
because I, you, you know, depending on whether or not I was exercising that faith and uh, just tapping into that grace that's available to all of us. So, yeah, I don't want to keep rattling on, but I thought about that. Oh, no, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, I have in front of you just a crowd, an endless crowd of people. And this is what we're facing as God's remnant church. There are a sea of people who were born into a system designed to break God's law. Even if we take out everybody who's not a Christian and only deal with Christianity in general, it's systematically designed to break the fourth commandment. And even, I would even venture to say the first four. <laughs> you know, the graven images are everywhere. Putting other gods before the Lord is everywhere. Uh, and it's not because they, quote unquote, agree with it. God says his people are out there and they are thinking where I'm at is not it. Something is wrong here, but I don't know an alternative. You see, there are people who um, don't know anything about what we teach and what we believe. So they are just settling for what they were born into or what they ran into. And it is our job to be fit for the fight. It's our job to put away those things that we were concerned about as children and now that we are adults, we got to think and act like adults. It is high time for us to set aside bickering over pants and drums and whether the church is too cold or too hot or who's in charge and who's doing this and who's doing that. These people need a word from the Lord. That some of them have been waiting their entire lives. I remember uh, Pastor Bushner <laughs> baptized somebody one time. I think they were in their 80s or 90s. I can't remember exactly, but they were up there. And they had just heard about the Sabbath for the very first time. These people are not far away. They are very close. But if we don't have the proper balance between law and grace, we can be so conflicted with our own relationship with God that we're literally stepping over people who could be saved, but they may die in their sins. That's the purpose of Satan wanting to distract us, want us, want us to be like Cain, to be, be uh, obedient but bitter. That's not God planned for us. I keep telling you that God's plan is that our joy is full. And how do our joy get full? We realize how we realize how blessed we are in spite of our sin and our shortcomings. Jesus didn't come to enforce our guilt-ridden obedience. No, he came to free us from the guilt of sin. He came to liberate us from the past that we struggle to survive, to make available a future that we never thought we could have. But the only way to get there is to see our Father as really our Father in heaven. If we really see him the way that he is, then it's no problem to reverence his name. All right, y'all, I hope that you enjoyed this uh, installment of our lesson tonight. We talked about the ceiling and we're gonna continue to build upon it on next week. Are there any final uh, comments or uh, requests or questions before we leave tonight? Everybody's muted, everybody's quiet. So if there's nothing, then we're going to pray, and we hope to see you, Lord willing, on Friday night in Sabbath school at 8 o'clock. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together tonight. We ask, Lord, that um, every single person on this line takes what we have read and what we have brought to the forefront personally 
and ask, Lord, am I in a right place with you? Am I walking in the steps of Abel or am I walking in the footsteps of Cain? We all say it as a cliche, Satan doesn't mind us going to church. He just wants us lost at church. And God forbid, we know that is not your will. Lord, we pray now that you liberate us from being so concerned about what other people think and align us with, with how you see us. You keep telling us that we are yours, that uh, you smile when you see us. You get happy when you hear our voice. You love to spend time with us. Lord, please help us to see you as you really are and not as Satan has presented you. Take away all bitterness and strife and resentment toward our walk. And Lord, give us the peace that passes understanding is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.